So, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our third talk of NCU Delta Online Talk series. So, I think there might be some new audience here. You know, every time we have new audience. So, uh, bear with me. I have to do some, you know, introductions. So, for those you haven't heard it before, this talk series will be given by the awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship. So this award was established by the National Center University and the Delta Electronics Foundation to recognize young scholars under the age of 45 who have, uh, who have made outstanding contributions in this field. So each year, the awardee will be invited to Taiwan uh, to interact with the local astronomers and the public. So I think the first award was given almost 10 years ago. So uh, the original plan for this year was to invite all you know, previous awardees to come to Taiwan, but we have decided to make this online due to uh, this COVID-19. So our speaker today is uh, Professor Nisim Kanika from uh, National Center for Radio Astrophysics of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So it's our really our great pleasure to have him here. So I think Nisim received this award in 2015 and he's a world expert, especially in radio and has received many, many fellowships and awards so far, such as Jansky Fellow, Max Planck Fellow, Fellowship. And recently, I believe he just got the Shanti Swar ben, uh, Bandakar, Bandakar, uh, sorry, I, I, this is Indian. So uh, yeah, for, forgive me if I didn't pronounce it correctly. So in 2017, yeah, I think uh, this is one of the highest science uh, awards in India. And, I think he has made you know, great contributions in many areas, including you know, the evolution studies of the evolutions of fundamental constant and evolution of formation of galaxies in just the medium using radio observations. So uh, today the title of his talk is uh, the Atomic Gas and Star Forming Galaxies at High Redshift. So just a few announcements before we start. Uh, please mute yourself during the talk. And if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the chat box you know, anytime you want. And we will come back to those questions you know, in the middle of the talk or during the Q&A after the talk. Okay, so great. So Nisim, I would let you take this away if you're ready. Great, yeah. Thank you, Yenchen. And yeah. thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there physically, but you know that's the way it is these days. Uh, uh, I should say at the start that uh, I tend to speak really fast, as you may have noticed. And I try to slow myself down uh, you know, in every talk, but I usually forget in about five minutes. So in case I forget, please uh, you know, just say, put, put, say something in the chat box and Yen Chen will, will unmute himself and uh, tell me to slow down. Uh, I'm gonna be telling you about observations of atomic gas at high redshifts, high over here being redshifts of one. And these are observations done with the telescope, uh, the giant meter bay radio telescope, which is the, the array that you see in the background of this image. You can see a bunch of antennas over here. This is the picture is taken from a hill uh, above the telescope. And the bulk of the work has been done by two outstanding students, uh, Apurva Bera on the left over here and Aditya Chaudhary on the right. I will be focusing more on Aditya's work just for out of interest of time. Uh, and, and because that's a slightly higher redshift, and uh, the other people involved in this work are listed over, over here. So let's move on. The, the, this is the broad outline of the talk. And then I'll get to the centerpiece of the talk, namely measuring the atomic gas mass of galaxies uh, via H1 21 centimeter emission studies. I'll spend some time telling you, you know, how we do this and the new technique that we are using, which is based on what is called 21 centimeter stacking. Uh, of the emission signals of multiple galaxies. I'll tell you a little bit about the upgraded giant meter wave radio telescope, the, the, the UGMRT as it's called, and why it is so good for 21 centimeter stacking. And then I'll move on to the three main results I'll be talking about today. One is based on the 350 hour uh, L band uh, observation of the extended growth strip, the EGS. Second one is based on a 400 hour uh, narrow band observation with the original GMRT of the deep two fields at redshifts of one. And the third is based on a 520 hour integration on the same D2 fields, but this time covering a much larger bandwidth and hence a much larger uh, redshift range. And, and the last two will be kind of merged together. I'll start with the pilot survey and then move on to, and we'll show you results from, 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 the, from the entire uh, set of data in one go. So that's the broad plan of the talk. 
But before we get there, let's talk about galaxies. So galaxies are basically made up of a bunch of things. They're made up of stars, which are usually in the disk of a galaxy. They're made up of atomic gas, which I will call H1 from now on, molecular gas, molecular hydrogen, mostly H2, and which are usually you know, sitting roughly around the stars. The H2 and the stars are normally closely associated. The H1 is often more extended. And that's the interstellar medium of a galaxy. The interstellar medium, the ISM, contains metals and dust as well. And that's all part of the galaxy itself, so, you know, which is in the disk, uh, in, in say the thick disk of the galaxy. But all around the galaxy, there's a circumgalactic medium. And this figure from Jason Tomlinson uh, in, in an annual reviews article a few years ago, she gives you a nice summary of the physical processes going on. So this shows a disk of a galaxy, which is over 15 kiloparsecs uh, in size and radius, which you can see by the small bar over here. And, and the, the, the disk is rotating. And you have this large region around it, which is about 500 kiloparsecs in size, half a megaparsec, and that contains lots of diffuse gas. And gas from this region, which is called certain galactic medium, is essentially accreting onto the galaxy. And this is mainly ionized hydrogen. Uh, and that's accreting onto the galaxy, and it's flowing into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as it flows onto the galaxy, the gas basically condenses into the disk of the galaxy, and it forms atomic hydrogen, H1. The H1 then cools and in, in local regions, and usually via metal radiation emission, uh, and it forms molecular hydrogen, H2. And the H2 then fragments under self-gravity and forms stars. So that's the process of star formation in the galaxy. But what happens next? What happens next is that stars live their lives, and then at the end of their lives, the bigger stars go supernovae and they throw a whole bunch of metals into the interstellar medium of the galaxy and also outside the galaxy. So they basically blow winds that go outside the galaxy. And so you wind up with, with the metals in the galaxy and these cause, cool, these cause further cooling of the atomic gas, which cause further formation of molecular hydrogen and further formation of stars and hence further formation of supernovae. In addition, the, the outflows that are blown away from the galaxy, which are shown over here, by these arrows going out away from the disk of the galaxy, these outflows drag back gas from the circumgalactic medium and pull, the, pull it back onto the plane of the, of the galaxy. And so you have recycling of gas that happens, which is shown by these curved uh, arrows over here, and which also drags down some amount of gas from the circumgalactic medium onto the disk of the galaxy. And so outflows result in recycling of the, of the gas but they also can, can actually balance gas in fall because there's some you know, flow going outwards. And so gas which is falling into the certain galactic medium can meet these outflows and stop, stop the inflow, so to speak. So a galaxy is a very complicated beast and it involves not just the actual physical parts of the galaxy, but also a large region, its sphere of influence, if you like, which is about a factor of 30 to 40 bigger than itself. So a galaxy is typically 10 to 30 kiloparsecs in size, and a certain galactic medium might be 500 uh, kiloparsecs or more uh, in size. And so the issues now over here are to form stars, you need to have gas accretion from the certain galactic medium. You need to have cooling of the, of the, uh, the accreted gas to form atomic hydrogen. You need to have further cooling of the atomic gas of the atomic hydrogen to form molecular hydrogen. And then you need to have fragmentation of the, of the molecular hydrogen to form stars. Those are the processes that give rise to star formation in a galaxy. So now, if you want to understand galaxies, what do you want to understand? What you want to understand, first of all, of course, are the stars themselves. So you'd like to know what is the stellar mass of a galaxy? What is the star formation rate of a galaxy, the current star formation rate? What's the star formation history of a galaxy? Uh, 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 did it form stars in a quiescent way, just continuously at some star formation rate? Was it starbursty? Did it suddenly ignite in star formation? and then become quiet again? What is its history in terms of star formation? And the way you do this, the way you probe uh, the stars and galaxies are via ultraviolet observations, usually, which, which give you access to young and massive stars, via near-infrared observations, which give you access to older stars, optical observations, of course, optical spectroscopy, for example, is extremely useful for this, mid-infrared observations, which can give you information about the star formation rate, far infrared observations, which actually probe the dust, which is heated by the ultraviolet radiation from the stars, and then emits in the far infrared. 
So by observing the far infrared, you can actually get information about the star formation rate of a galaxy. And similarly, the radio, because in the radio, you can observe the supernova remnants, which are again produced by the, by the death of massive stars, and also H2 regions uh, produced by the ionizing radiation of these massive stars. So the stars can be observed, the stars or their effects can be observed over a wide range of frequencies or wavelengths, ranging from the UV all the way up to the radio. And we have lots of information about the stars. Molecular hydrogen, which is the step which is just next to the stars, we'd like to understand the mass of molecular hydrogen in galaxies. And we'd like to understand a, a kind of funny construct called the cosmic mass density. That's the density of molecular hydrogen at any epoch in the universe, integrating over all the galaxies in the universe. And that tells us about the buildup of molecular hydrogen in galaxies, not about just one galaxy, but about an average over a lot of galaxies. And the standard tracer of molecular hydrogen uh, is, is CO rotational uh, transitions in the millimeter and submillimeter. And these have become a huge tool over the last decade with the advent of ALMA. And so now we know much more about CO uh, at high redshifts than we knew, say, in the, uh, in the 2000s. The next step in the, in the process, going backwards, is atomic hydrogen. Again, we want to know the mass and we want to know the cosmic mass density of atomic hydrogen in galaxies. And to get the mass, the only way of getting the mass that we know of today is via the H1 21 centimeter hyperfine line of atomic hydrogen. And that's at a frequency of 1420 megahertz, very low frequency. And so you need radio telescopes to observe this line. And you observe this line in emission. Uh, that's the only way of getting the atomic hydrogen mass of galaxies. The other way of probing atomic hydrogen is via Lyman alpha absorption. And this actually has been an interesting tool for the last 30 or so years, uh, observing what are called the damped Lyman alpha systems towards background quasars. And R.T. Wolf and collaborators have used this technique and, and many other people as well, but R.T. Wolf really led the field to measure the cosmic mass density in, in atomic hydrogen uh, and its evolution all the way down from redshifts about five and a half or so to the, to the nearby universe, say redshifts of uh, certainly one and a half or so. And then you can use 21 centimeter emission studies in the nearby universe, redshifts of zero, to also get the cosmic mass density and compare the two. And you find that things change by about a factor of two from redshifts of roughly three to redshifts of zero in terms of the cosmic mass density. But we don't know anything about the actual mass of galaxies uh, in the in atomic hydrogen. Because to, to do this, you need to observe the 21 centimeter emission line. And that's very hard to do, as you will see in a short while. Finally, the circumgalactic medium, which is the prime, you know, which is where all the gas comes from in the beginning. And you'd like to get the mass of this gas. You'd like to get the temperature of this gas. You'd like to get the metallicity of this gas. You'd like to see how much of effect the galaxy has in terms of throwing metals out. And the way you do this is via ultraviolet absorption, typically by X-ray or UV emission. And you observe these highly ionized species, uh, O6, O7, things like these, C4, in the circumgalactic medium. And you get a feeling for, how you, you, uh, for where the metals are distributed around the galaxy. And an excellent review article is by Jason Tumlinson a few years ago. And so how do we quantify these processes? A good quantifier is what is called the depletion, is time scales, basically. And so, one way of quantifying it is the consumption time scale or the depletion time scale, which is the time scale on which the molecular hydrogen, for example, would be eaten up by the process of star formation. And so that's simply the, the H2 depletion time scale is simply de defined by MH2, the mass in hydrogen, in molecular hydrogen, divided by the star formation rate. And that just says that, okay, if I keep forming stars at this star formation rate, how long will it take for all the molecular hydrogen to be eaten up? simple metric. And that means that if I don't form more molecular hydrogen before the molecular hydrogen is eaten up, star formation will stop. So it's a, it's a good metric for how long star formation can last without adding more molecular hydrogen. Very similarly, you have the H1 depletion time scale. Again, the H1 mass divided by the star formation rate. And that tells you how long star formation can last without the addition of more uh, atomic hydrogen from the circumgalactic medium. And then, of course, there is the gas accretion time scale. On what rate does the, the, does the gas accrete onto galaxies from the circumgalactic medium? And this is an interesting issue by itself. This depends really on the nature of the accretion, on whether it's, it's, it, it, accretion happens by what is called the hot mode, where things basically come in more or less spherically. 
and then uh, are heated uh, uh, to, to the virial temperature of the halo, which is about a million degrees Kelvin, and then they have to cool. And this process is very slow. The alternative, and this, this is the classic picture of galaxy formation, you know, which goes back to Reese and company in the, in the 70s. The other way of, of having gas secretion is what is called the cold mode, in which, uh, in which gas flows in not spherically, but along filaments. And that's the kind of picture that you saw over here, where the accreting gas is coming in along, you know, along filament in the circumgalactic medium. And over here in the cold mode, the gas is not heated up to, to the virial temperature of the halo. It actually accretes at about 10,000 degrees Kelvin or so. And, that, and, and the effect of this is that you don't have to spend much time cooling. So the process of accretion can be much faster. Now, the question is which of these modes dominates? And that's been a huge issue of debate over the last 15 or so years since Dushan Keris's fairly seminal paper in 2005. And the third way in which you can add gas onto galaxies, of course, is mergers. You just take two galaxies, bang them together. Minor mergers, you, you would add gas to the bigger galaxy and also fuel star formation. Major mergers, you will form a starburst almost certainly. So these are the three ways in which you can add gas to a galaxy. And the question of which of these dominates at which redshift and for which kinds of galaxies are important questions in galaxy uh, formation and evolution. So I think I'll stop here for a second. Would anybody like to ask a question about, uh, uh, um, about any of this stuff? Okay. Any questions for Nisim? You can either speak you know, directly to Nisim or you know, if you want to can leave your message in the chat box. Any questions so far? So for the depletion time scale here, this, for, uh, this star formation rate, you. Assume it's a, like a constant or because uh, it's like approximation. Yeah, so, so you actually are just measuring a number at that point of time. And that tells you, because all you have is, is an in-situ measurement exactly at that time. It, it's right. just a measurement. And what you would do is that you would look at other galaxies at earlier times, which have similar properties. And then ask the question, how does the repletion time vary with, with redshift? For a single galaxy, you just have a single measurement. And that's all you can do. Right. Okay, I just wonder because I, this you know, star function rate could vary and- Exactly, yeah, yeah. So all you have, in fact, that's really what will physically happen. Once the H2 content starts to drop or the H1 content starts to drop, the star function rate will decline and that will turn out to be important in, for, in the rest of this talk. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, other questions? So if not, I think we can just move in you know, okay. forward. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. okay, moving on. So let's move to the deep fields. So the deep fields are what really changed our view of the high redshift universe. And this happened around starting from about the late 90s. So the deep fields were basically regions in the sky where, which were targeted by choice with the great observatories originally, and then with a large number of big telescopes. And these had deep imaging and spectroscopy with, the, with optical and near infrared telescopes. And then later with mid infrared and far infrared telescopes, and of course, radio as well. And so this, this happened in the 90s, in the, in the 90s, because of course the Hubble Space Telescope went up. So the Hubble Deep Fields, the Hubble Deep Fields were the two big uh, initial deep fields. And then of course the Keck Telescope had come online. Now you could do lots of ground-based spectroscopy. Then the VLT and Gemini and so on came online and you could do uh, deeper or comparably deep spectroscopy in the North and the South. And, uh, and then of course you, got, you had these wide field instruments that started coming online. For example, originally on the NOAO telescopes, which was, for example, the Buddhist field, which is a really large region in the sky, was done with the NOAO telescopes. So now Subaru has really swept the field, so to speak, with their spectacular instruments, which let you do really large regions in one go. And uh, the, the other thing that happened in the late 90s, mostly from work by uh, Chuck Steidel and collaborators, was the use of the Lyman Brake technique to identify star-forming galaxies at high redshifts. And this was, it was a known technique that Raja Guha Thakurta had done this originally, but Chuck Steidel really did it in detail in the 90s. And that hugely increased the number of galaxies that were known at redshifts above three. And that completely changed our view of the universe. So what's shown over here in the right panel is, uh, is a view of a simulation. That's the background uh, image. And a scale over here, which is about one degree in the sky, which corresponds to about 90 megaparsecs at a redshift of two. And this shows you examples of the size of the sizes of different uh, deep fields. And you can see the largest of these is the, NO, the NOAO Deep Wide Field Survey. 
uh, which is a huge region, which is about uh, four square degrees in size. The Cosmos region is a huge region as well. It's about two square degrees in size. And, and then you have these smaller regions, Subaru Deep Field, the Chandra Deep Field South, the extended Chandra Deep Field South, the Yukid Survey, the yellow regions are the Candles uh, uh, Survey, which is uh, an HST ACS, uh, predominantly ACS, but also by field camera three uh, survey. And this diagonal thing over here is the, uh, is the extended growth strip. The large region is the growth strip, but again, the yellow strip being the Candles region. And now, of course, you should really add on, this is from a paper in 2014, a review article in 2014 by Piero Madao and Matt Dickinson. Now, of course, the Subaru uh, wide field surveys are, uh, dramatic, uh, I would say, dominating this field. Spectroscopy of these uh, is, uh, is important, and that's something which is still lacking, and which will come in probably once the prime focus spectrograph is built. But that's, been, that's really changed our view of the universe, and has resulted in about in thousands of galaxies out of redshifts of six, hundreds out of redshifts of eight, and most of these are via photometric redshifts. So that's fantastic. And so we've learned a heck of a lot about the universe. And one of the things that we've learned, perhaps the most important thing, is summarized in this plot which basically shows the star formation rate density, if you like the star formation activity of the universe, in solar masses per year per cubic megaparsec, plotted as a function of redshift. And I haven't bothered too much about, I mean, these points are from, from a variety of surveys, including Spitzer, uh, the optical deep fields, and so on. Ignore that for a minute, and let's just look at the broad properties of this plot. What you see is that the star formation rate density in galaxies is extremely low at redshifts of about eight. And it rises steadily from redshifts about eight to about redshifts of three. And then there's a plateau. This plateau goes from redshifts of about three to redshifts of about one. And then there's this remarkably steep decline from redshifts of one to two today over the last eight or so billion years. So for about 13 or so billion years ago, up to about 11 billion years uh, uh, ago, the star formation rate density rose, then stayed flat for three billion years, and then it declined steeply. So today, our star formation rate density, or if you like the star formation activity in the universe, is, is lower by an order of magnitude than it was at the peak of star formation in the universe. And this region, roughly redshifts of one to three, is called, or this epoch, is called the epoch of galaxy assembly. And the reason for this is that roughly half of today's stars, the stars that we see in today's galaxies, were formed at redshifts of one to three. Very few stars are formed later in the universe, this is where the action is in terms of star formation. But the remarkable thing, of course, is why did this decline happen? Why didn't things continue at a high star formation rate beyond redshifts of one? We see the star formation rate density declines by an order of magnitude. And this is one of the open questions in the field of galaxy evolution. And there have been a number of suggestions. You know, for example, maybe there's, there's a lack of fuel for star formation. There's not much gas in galaxies. Maybe for some reason, H1 doesn't convert efficiently to H2 at lower redshifts. Surprising, but you know, possible. Maybe the gas in the certain galactic medium gets uh, eaten up, unclear. Maybe feedback limits the accretion rate. You know, all of these are hand-waving possibilities, and we haven't had an answer to this question, this very fundamental question, primarily because we have no idea about what's happening to the gas. And the gas is the fuel for star formation. So if you want to understand the star formation, so th this plot, although it's fantastic, this plot is telling you what's happening. It's not telling you why it's happening. If you want to understand why star formation evolved the way in which it evolved in the universe, you must look at the gas. And that's been hard. So the primary, uh, the, the basic thing which forms stars is molecular gas. So let's look at molecular gas. And I said that you know, the CO rotational lines are the main tracer of the molecular gas. The problem with CO, unfortunately, is that it's not really tracing the, it, CO is uh, the second most abundant molecule in the universe. Molecular hydrogen H2 is the most abundant molecule. CO is much less abundant, it's about a factor of one part and 10 to the four less abundant than H2. And so you're, 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 you're measuring a very small tail on a fairly large dog uh, by observing CO. And, until ALMA came along, it was really hard to measure CO in even in line break galaxies, which are fairly big galaxies. Today, it's still very hard, even with ALMA, to measure CO emission in um, normal galaxies, medium-sized galaxies, redshifts of two. And that's just because of complications, because the CO2H2 conversion factor is different in uh, smaller in lower metallicity galaxies. 
but lots of work mainly by Rana Genzel's group, Linda Taconi uh, has been has, has led that project, has shown that molecular gas mass in large galaxies is in big galaxies, again, let me emphasize, is comparable to the stellar mass at redshifts higher than one. And this is a plot from a paper by Genzel and collaborators, which shows uh, the ratio of, of, if you like, the molecular gas fraction relative to stars in main sequence galaxies as a function of redshift. And you can see that this is kind of steadily rising. And by about redshifts of one, one and a half, you've hit about uh, a ratio of one. In the local universe, there's much less H2 than, st uh, than stars in, in, in typical main sequence galaxies. In the Milky Way, for example, the amount of H2 is about a factor of, thir of 30 smaller than the amount of stars. And if you look at the figure on the right, this shows the cosmological mass density in molecular hydrogen as a function of redshift. And the first thing that you see over here is that the error bars are gigantic on each of these boxes. And these are from fairly deep observations from, with, with ALMA and the JVLA and NOEMA. But unfortunately, because the field of view in the, in the millimeter is fairly small, you're only covering tiny regions of the sky. So this is something on which you know, much work will clearly happen over the next decade or so. Uh, much of many of these observations are limited by cosmic variance because the, the regions that you're looking at are small. So the error bars are large. But what you still see, at least in a hand-waving way, is evidence that the molecular gas density kind of rises out of redshifts about one, and then also declines. Again, error bars are large, let me emphasize that. But there's some tentative evidence for decline in the molecular gas mass density at redshifts less than about one. Again, we don't know why this, this happens, but this is kind of consistent with the evolution of the star formation rate density. But again, why does this happen? We don't know. So to understand this, we need to observe the atomic hydrogen. That's the primary fuel for star formation in galaxies. And so let's move on to the atomic hydrogen mass of high redshift galaxies. And I said that you can do this via the H1 21 centimeter emission line. The problem with the H1 21 centimeter emission line is that the line is a highly forbidden hyperfine transition. The Einstein A coefficient is tiny. It's about uh, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 15 per second, which is ridiculous. It's about uh, 10 to the power 23, 23 orders of magnitude smaller than the Einstein A coefficient of the Lyman alpha or Baumer alpha lines. So it's a ridiculously weak line, and that makes it very difficult to observe this line at cosmological distances. So the highest redshift at which we have a detection of uh, 21 centimeter emission is 0.376. And from a deep observation with the VLA by Jimena Fernandez and collaborators, we have a bunch of detections of redshifts of 0.2, 0.25. It is very, very, very hard to detect 21 centimeter emission from an individual galaxy at a redshift of, for example, one. So how do we get around this problem? The way you get around it is by using a technique that Martin Zwan and Jairam Chingalur came up with about 20 years ago called 21 centimeter stacking. The idea is that if you have a lot of galaxies within your field of view, and remember low frequency telescopes have a large field of view. If you have a lot of galaxies, and if you know the redshifts of each galaxy and their locations, what you can do is that if you can cover all these galaxies simultaneously in their 21 centimeter line, then you can analyze the data for this, for this, uh, for, for this field and make a spectral cube. And that spectral cube contains a 21 centimeter emission for all the galaxies. Now you can take spectra, the positions of each galaxy, and then you can align the spectra in the rest frame of the galaxy and then simply add them. What will happen is that at the velocities where this 21 centimeter emission, there'll be the spectra will be slightly positive. The 21 centimeter emission, of course, will be really faint. It will be buried in the noise, but the spectra will be slightly biased upwards. In regions without emission, the spectra will basically be noise and there'll be equal positives and negatives. And now if you average enough galaxies, you will wind up with the noise going down proportional to one upon square root of the number of galaxies and the emission signal slowly coming out. And so let's see an example of this. This is a movie that shows a slice of a cube and the red circles are now galaxies over here. And each of these small regions over here is a plane for, uh, is a small region around each of these galaxies. And what you're doing over here is aligning the signals of these galaxies in the extreme right top panel, aligning the spectra the vertical red lines show you the redshift. You're aligning them over here, and you're stacking these over here. In the image, you're also stacking them. 
but he's stacking them in the image plane. Here on the right side, he's stacking them in the spectral domain. That's the game over here. And you'll see steadily as you keep as you keep adding more and more and more galaxies, you see a spec you see a thing building up in the center of this region over here. You're aligning them spatially, remember? And you'll also see a signal building up in the spectrum, in the stacked spectrum. There's about 100 galaxies stacked now, and you can now just about start to see a red blob coming up over here. And you can just about start to see a weak emission feature coming up over here. And so we'll keep going through this thing. But what do you need for this? What do you need, of course, is a large galaxy sample in the primary beam. So your interferometer is made up of a bunch of telescopes, and each of them has a large field of view. You need lots of galaxies in there, and you need accurate positions and redshifts of those galaxies, because the, the positions are usually easy in the optical, but the redshifts are important because you need to align them spectrally. So you need redshift accuracies of about 100 kilometers per second or better. Otherwise, the lines will not align perfectly when you want to stack the 21 centimeter uh, emission. And finally, of course, you need to have the right redshift range. You need the galaxies uh, in the redshift range covered by the frequency of your uh, telescope and the redshift 21 centimeter line frequency. So that's finally you know, the thing that you get with about 400 galaxies over here. You see this beautiful strong signal and you see this beautiful strong emission line just by stacking 400 galaxies in your cube. The individual signals were not detectable, but when you stack the 400 galaxies, the signal to noise ratio improved by square root of, of 400, which is about a factor of 20, and that allowed you to, to, to detect the signal, both in terms of the spectrum itself and in terms of the, uh, in the spatial domain. And this is beautiful because now in the spatial domain stacking, you can even measure the average size of the galaxy if I have enough resolution. In the spectral domain, I can measure the average velocity width of the galaxy. But for the basic uh, thing that you want to measure the, the H1 mass, this thing, the, the, the spectrum, immediately gives you, because now you've got the average 21 centimeter emission, it immediately gives you the, the, the H1 mass of the average galaxy in this sample. And so that's the game over here. That's what you're trying to do with 21 centimeter emission studies. And this has been done, this was done in the 2000s at redshifts less than 0.2. And then we tried this at redshifts of 1.3 with the old GMRT, and we got a limit on the H1 mass uh, of about 850 galaxies. So that was a situation about five years ago when things started to change. So what changed? The first thing that changed was that we upgraded the, the, the GMRT. So the GMRT consists of 30 antennas, each of which has a diameter of 45 meters and a mesh uh, surface. And it's got a prime focus feed. And this shows a bunch of the GMRT antennas over here. There's 30 antennas of which 14 are within the central region of size about one kilometer. And 16 antennas are in the arms of a Y. So it's like the VLA, but with 16 antennas in a Y, 14 in the center, and the antennas cannot move. And we go out to about 25 kilometer baselines. Each arm is about 12 kilometers long. And that is the old GMRT. The new GMRT, the upgraded GMRT is the same as this exactly. The difference is that the old GMRT had narrowband receivers. We covered uh, four frequencies of, we actually covered five frequencies, but I'm not talking about that. From 225 to 245 megahertz, 300 to 360, 580 to 660, and 980 to 1500. And we had a very narrow band correlator which covered only 33 megahertz of bandwidth with 512 channels. In the upgrade, we now have new receivers, four receivers only, which cover 125 to 250 megahertz, 250 to 500, 550 to 850, and 980 to 1500. This receiver hasn't changed, but you can see that these three receivers now cover a much larger frequency range. And that makes the stacking process much, much more efficient because the large frequency range means that a single observation can cover a much larger redshift range and hence more galaxies. In addition, we have a new correlator, which is a bandwidth of 400 megahertz with 16,000 channels. Again, the, 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 the wide bandwidth correlator lets us cover more galaxies. So this has completely changed the field. And this plot now shows you an example of what the GMRT, the new GMRT, the updated GMRT can do. These are the three highest uh, frequency bands, band five in green over here, band four in red, band three in blue. And these show the sensitivities of the upgraded GMRT, what is called the, uh, the SCFD of the telescope. 
And you can see it's kind of flat uh, all the way from about 1500 megahertz to about 250 megahertz, and that's great. And these correspond uh, to different redshifts over here. I'll show you exactly what redshifts in a second. But this basically means we have excellent sensitivity for 21 centimeter studies out to redshifts of four. So the redshifts are shown up here. We can go out to redshifts of four uh, with, the, with band three. And because we had have a much bigger bandwidth now, we can cover a large number of galaxies compared to, for example, the old GMRT who had a narrow bandwidth. And finally, we have a large field of view, half a, half a degree at band five, 0.75 degrees at band four, and one degree at band three. So we can do about, about you know, 0.75 degrees at in this red region over here, which means, again, we have a, because a large field of view, we can cover lots of galaxies. So the projects I'm going to be talking about are a 350-hour band five survey of the dot strip, which covers redshifts of about 0.4 to about zero. But we have redshift information in this narrow redshift range, 0.2 to 0.4. So that's one. That's the green band. And that corresponds to this redshift range in the Madao plot over here. The next one is a 520-hour band four survey of seven deep two fields covering this large redshift range, 0.75 to 1.45, with this uh, band four receiver, and also a 400-hour old GMRT survey covering a much narrower redshift range. And that's going to be the bulk of this, of this talk. And then finally, we started off a new project with 400 hours covering this uh, frequency range in band three and the redshift range 1.8 to about 2.8. And I will not talk about that except to say that the observations have begun. But you can see now in this, in the figure over here, in the star formation rate density figure, uh, we are covering the decline of the star formation rate density, the epoch at which the decline starts to happen, the end of the epoch galaxy assembly and the actual decline, and finally, the main epoch of galaxy assembly. So we plan to use these atomic gas, these stacking studies, to probe the H1, uh, the H1 mass of galaxies all the way out to redshifts of three using the upgraded GMRT over the next couple of years. So what do we need for this? I'm going to focus now again on these two uh, redshift ranges, 0.2 all the way out to 1.45. I will not talk about redshifts of 1.8 to 2.8. We need an optical galaxy redshift survey. We need, uh, basically, we need a bunch of redshifts that we can, so that we can stack the galaxies. We want galaxy redshifts at redshifts of 0 to 0.4 and 0.7 to 1.45. And we want accurate redshifts, redshift errors less than 100 kilometers per second. And we want regions, areas of the sky, which are matched to the size of the telescope beam. And that's a slightly more complicated one, right? Because you know, you, 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 a survey which covers a large region of the sky with high redshift accuracy is not good for us because we want to have a lot of galaxies in a single pointing. And it turns out that fortuitously, the deep two redshift survey, the deep two galaxy survey is almost ideal for us. This was done in the mid 2000s by a group led by Sandy Faber, Faber and Mike Davis. And it used about 90 Keck nights to observe uh, four fields, the, the, what are called the deep two fields, two, three, and four, and the extended growth strip over here, the much larger region around the growth strip. And for the, for the extended growth strip, there's no redshift selection. So they cover redshifts of 0.2 to 1.45 uniformly with uh, R magnitude less than 24.1. So all galaxies brighter than 24.1 in, in the EGS. And for the deep fields, they use color selection and they got galaxies only in the redshift range 0.7 to 1.45, again with the same selection in R magnitude less than 24.1. And this is kind of remarkable because this redshift range is exactly our redshift range for the band four receivers. And that's coincidental. But of course, it's not entirely coincidental. The reason they chose that redshift range is that that redshift range is important for galaxy formation and evolution. And of course, the reason we chose our redshift range is partly because it is uh, important for galaxy formation and evolution. It's partly also observational reasons. But this is the redshift range that we want to really go after. So the Deep 2 survey gave us 38,000 galaxies at redshifts. And wonderfully, the redshift accuracy is 55 kilometers per second. It's perfect almost for our stacking purposes. And even better, so these are the, are the deep two fields over here. So deep two field two, three, and four. These are regions where they have spectroscopy. And what I've done over here, or what Aditya has done over here, is to overlay the GMRT primary beam on each of these regions. And you can see that these regions are nicely matched to the GMRT beam, reasonably matched, not, not perfectly matched, but reasonably matched. 
And so with seven pointings, we can cover the bulk of the deep two survey. There are still small region missed out, the regions in gray over here, but most of the galaxies can be covered in seven pointings. And, uh, and the, the numbers over here are the number of galaxies that we're covering. And we come to about 15,000 galaxies in all with these seven pointings. For the EGS, things are a little more messy. They're messy because there's an extremely bright uh, radio source, VC295, sitting south of the EGS, which makes life difficult. And plus, this region is, is, is two degrees on the side and only 0.25 degrees in width. And so that's the GMRT uh, beam at band five. And, and of course, the GMRT beam band four would be even bigger. So we chose to observe this in band five, covering the candles region uh, of the EGS. So these are the two projects that we did. This region is covered in band four, the deep two fields, and the EGS is covered in band five, the single very deep pointing. So I'm going to show you just one result from the EGS. And here we basically stacked, you know, with 350 hours of data, we stacked 540 or so galaxies, all blue star forming galaxies at a redshift of 0.35. And we stacked the 21 centimeter line from these galaxies and also the 1.4 gigahertz continuum from these galaxies to get the star formation rates from the radio. And you see this beautiful signal over here in the 21 centimeter emission. This is about, I don't know, 12 sigma result. Each point over here is independent and uh, it aligns quite nicely with zero velocity. You can see a hint of a second component coming up over here, which could just be, you know, the classic double horned profile of galaxies. And you see that the star formation rate or the 1.4 gigahertz continuum, the stack continuum is nicely detected as well. So we can use this to measure the gas depletion time. So we got an average H1 mass of about five times 10 to the nine solar masses. We got a star formation rate of about half a solar mass per year, not very high, at a redshift of 0.35. And we got a gas depletion time, taking the ratio of one to the other, of about nine giga years. And that's similar to local star forming galaxies. And what this tells you is that there's not been much change in the star formation efficiency of galaxies from a redshift of zero to 0.35. Okay, not very surprising. 0.35 is not that long ago, it's about four billion years ago. There are more interesting results uh, from this uh, survey, but I, I won't talk about them now. You can do scaling relations, for example, at redshift of 0.35, and we do see evolution in those scaling relations, but I won't talk about that now because I'd like to get to redshift of one where a lot of the action is. So for redshift of one, we did this 550 to 850 megahertz survey of the deep two fields. And uh, funnily enough, we had actually started the observation with the old GMRT, but before we finished analyzing those data, before we actually started a real serious analysis of those data, the new receivers came along. And so we did a pilot survey in 2018 with about 20 hours on five deep two fields, 10 hours got wiped out, we had 90 hours in all. And we covered 1.2 square degrees on the sky. And we had about 11,300 galaxies, which are all shown over here with the GMRT pointings. And these are the continuum images of the five fields. And we got down to you know, fairly deep continuum images, which let us measure the star formation rates. That is great. And that's what we saw. And this completely blew us away. So basically we excluded active galaxy nuclei, AGNs, we excluded red galaxies. And of course we excluded galaxies affected by RFI. We wound up with about 7,700 galaxies out of the, the original 11,300. And these are an average stellar mass of about 9.5 times 10 to the nine solar masses. When we stack the spectra, we see this beautiful signal coming out over here. The dashed lines over here are the, the, the one sigma errors at each velocity channel obtained via Monte Carlo uh, simulation. And what you see over here is the emission in the image plane. And this had a redshift of one, the average redshift is, is 1.03. And this is the first detection of 21 centimeter emission from the epochal galaxy assembly. So it was just spectacular, it blew us away. And we got an average H1 mass of about 1.2 times 10 to the 10 solar masses at this redshift. And as you can see, this is slightly larger than the average stellar mass. So basically galaxies are highly gas dominated by a redshift of one. Again, very unlike galaxies in today's universe, but now we are measuring all kinds of galaxies. It's not just the biggest galaxies. We're measuring all star forming galaxies uh, with a stellar mass of about larger than 10 to the nine uh, solar masses. Uh, and we find that the average H1 mass is larger than the average stellar mass. So then this now we actually kind of go backwards in time. This was the narrow band survey with the old GMRT, which we then analyzed after analyzing the pilot survey data. This was 400 hours. 
uh, with 60 hours per deep two field, but with the old receivers and the old correlator. And what we did here was that because the correlator has a much narrower bandwidth, 33 megahertz, we had far fewer galaxies. So we stacked the 21 centimeter emission from only about 2,850 galaxies now at a much narrower redshift range, 1.2 to 1.4. This paper just come out in 2021. And again, you see completely independently the same signal, uh, now seen at five sigma significance. This is at about 4.6 4 sigma. This is five sigma. Completely independent receivers, completely independent correlator, same signal seen in the image plane. And now the average H1 mass is 3.1 times 10 to the 10 solar masses at a higher redshift, redshift to 1.3. So now we're pushing into the epoch galaxy assembly. And, and you might see that the H1 mass seems higher over here than over here, it's nearly three times higher. And the reason for this is actually quite simple. We had higher redshifts over here. And the fact that we had higher redshifts, remember the deep two galaxies are chosen with an R band uh, magnitude selection. The higher redshift means that we have brighter galaxies and more massive galaxies with higher star formation rates at these redshifts. And so if you do a, if you do a, a sample matched by absolute magnitude, it turns out that there's no strong evidence for evolution in the average H1 mass. Although I'll show you an example of this in a minute. From, from these data, there's no direct evidence for evolution. So that's the result from 400 hours of observations, but with a narrow band correlator. What came next? What came next is a 520 hour integration that includes the pilot survey, but now using the full bandwidth. So this is the full upgraded GMRT survey with seven deep two fields, all seven fields now, 75 hours of uh, updated GMRT telescope observations. And this is a paper in preparation. And we had, we stacked uh, the 21 centimeter line from 11,400 star forming galaxies over this entire redshift range, 0.7 to 1.45, and over a 1.7 square degree region. The, the size of the region is, is important because that a large size means that you don't have to worry about cosmic variance. And we are exactly in the neck of the woods where cosmic variance is not an issue. In fact, the deep two survey was chosen to cover about a two square degree region to overcome cosmic variance. And what you see over here, of course, is an absolutely beautiful detection. It's now about an eight sigma result. And you can see that this thing shows up just wonderfully as a clear detection of emission in the, in the stacked image plane. And we wind up with an average H1 mass now of about 8.8 .8 times 10 to the nine solar masses, slightly lower than our previous result. And so, but the, the result still remains that, it's, that the H1 mass is comparable to the stellar mass at, uh, at these redshifts, the average stellar mass is similar to this number. But what is even more interesting now is that the signal to noise ratio is now high enough that we can actually examine the dependence of the H1 mass on various properties of the galaxies. For example, the stellar mass, the redshift, the star formation rate, the galaxy environment, which you know, would be super interesting to see whether you have evidence, for example, of gas, of stripping of gas, which we see in the local universe. And we can now just about start to do these things because of the high signal noise ratio uh, of this current uh, uh, result. So I'll show you a few teasers for this. So the first is the evidence for redshift evolution. So what we did was that we, so our, uh, this gray region over here shows our redshift coverage, 0.7 to 1.5. And so we took the median redshift, which is 1.14, and we stacked the galaxies above this redshift and below this redshift uh, separately. And we used galaxies with an absolute magnitude cut of MB of minus 21. So that we're comparing apples and apples. Uh, only galaxies above brighter than an, an absolute magnitude of, of minus 21 were used at all redshifts. And the reason we did this was that this is the deep two completeness at the highest redshift uh, of our sample. And which means that the deep two catalog is complete uh, for, this, for this magnitude limit. And what you see over here is, is the orange spectrum shows a situation for the higher redshift bin, redshift less larger than 1.14. And the blue spectrum is for the lower redshift bin. And you can see that the orange spectrum is much stronger. The average H, ouch, the average H1 mass for the higher redshift bin is about two times 10 to the 10 solar masses. The average H1 mass for the lower redshift bin is about seven times 10 to the nine solar masses. It's still at about two and a half sigma. So we clearly need to do more work, but tentatively, we're finding evidence that the average H1 mass in the epochal galaxy assembly. Remember, this is now 1.14 to 1.45. This is in the epochal galaxy assembly. And this, the bulk of this is after the epochal galaxy assembly. There's more H1 in galaxies above redshifts of 1.1 than there is in galaxy redshifts of less than 1.1.
The second thing you can do is that you can take the same data and now you can, you can divide by the stellar mass of these galaxies. And now you can compare the ratio, the gas fraction, if you like, the ratio of H1 mass to stellar mass. And what you see is the same thing. What you see is that, so now this is the ratio of H1 mass to stellar mass. And you can see a dramatic drop, which happens uh, just at the end of the epoch galaxy assembly, which is about you know, somewhere here. The H1 mass to stellar mass is much higher in the higher redshift bin than in the lower redshift bin. And you can now compare to redshifts of zero with the XCAS sample from Barbara Cartanella and collaborators. And you can see that at redshifts of one, the H1 mass to stellar mass is very similar to the ratio in local galaxies, but it jumps at redshifts of about of larger than 1.15. So both the average H1 mass and the H1 fraction are higher at redshifts larger than 1.1. And that's tentative evidence now. It's only at about two and a half sigma significance, but very tantalizing evidence. The second thing is, what about the gas depletion time scale? As I said, the gas depletion time scale is a ratio basically of M gas to star formation rate. And it tells you how long can a galaxy sustain its star formation rate without adding fresh gas. So in the local universe and nearby galaxies, the H2 depletion time scale is about 1 billion years, roughly. And what this tells you is that if, suppose we somehow stopped the conversion of H1 to H2 for some reason, star formation would stop on the time scale of 1 billion years. And that's from work, for example, by, by, by uh, Amelie saint and collaborators, again from the XCAS sample. But, and so that's a very short time scale. But in the local universe, the H1 depletion time scale in bright galaxy like the Milky Way is much longer than this. It's about seven and a half billion years. And what that tells you is that if the conversion of ionized gas to atomic gas stops, star formation would stop on a much longer time scale, seven and a half billion years. Again, this is from work by Barbara Cartanella and collaborators, the same sample, the XCAS sample. And what this says is that the availability of H1 is not a bottleneck for star formation in the local universe. There's lots of time to continue building up your H1 reservoir in galaxies. So accretion can happen on a fairly slow time scale in nearby galaxies. Star formation will not stop because there is a lot of H1 in galaxies in the local universe. The star formation rate is not high enough fast enough to eat it up very quickly. So let's look at the situation now at redshifts of one. What we did was that we measured the median star formation rate by stacking the 1.4 gigahertz continuum. And that's the continuum stack. You can see that the stacked emission is detected uh, at very high single size ratio. And we get a star formation rate of about eight solar masses per year. And what that tells us is that if we take the ratio of the H1 mass by the, by the star formation rate, and this is the original, the, the pilot study, we get an H1 depletion time of about 1.5 billion years, much less than the H1 depletion time in the local universe. Even more interesting, if you take bright galaxies with MB of uh, uh, less than minus 21, we wind up with an H1 depletion time of about 1 billion years. And for exactly these galaxies, the H2 depletion time at a redshift of 1.3 is about 0.7 billion years. So what we're saying is that the H1 and H2 depletion time scales at a redshift of 1, 1 1.3 is very comparable, are very comparable. And what this tells you now is that you will have quenching of star formation on timescales of about one to two giga years, unless you can produce accretion of fresh gas from the circumgalactic medium. And that's summarized in this plot over here, where the red circle is the depletion time scale for X gas galaxies in the local universe, seven and a half billion years, while the red, the red square over here is the H1 depletion time scale for the deep two galaxies at redshifts of one. The blue square is the H1 depletion time scale for bright galaxies. And you can see that's bang on the H2 depletion time scale from, from the FIB sample. So what's, what this plot is telling you is that the depletion time scales for star forming galaxies at redshifts of one are extremely short and you will have a decline in star formation activity below redshifts of one, if you don't produce, if you don't accrete gas very quickly onto them. So if the gas accretion is, is not very efficient at redshifts of one, you will rapidly stop uh, star formation in these galaxies. And this was uh, what we suggested as a, as a possibility in this 2020 paper, that basically the reason for star formation declining in galaxies below redshifts of one is insufficient accretion. Can we do better than this?
Now with a full survey, we can actually look at how the depletion time scale varies as a function of stellar mass. So what we've done over here is that we have stacked the H1 emission in multiple bins of stellar mass over here. So each point over here, each circle is now a, a, an independent stack of the 21 centimeter emission signal. And we've also stacked the, the 1.4 gigahertz continuum for each of these sets of galaxies. And we can now measure the 1.4 gigahertz, we can measure the gas depletion time for each bin of stellar mass. And what you see is that the gas depletion time is actually somewhat high, a couple of billion years at low stellar masses. As you move to higher and higher stellar masses above 10 to the 10 solar masses, the gas depletion time is very short. It's more like 0.7 billion years. Uh, that's the relation that you get for the gas depletion time. And this solid uh, blue, uh, blue line over here is the gas depletion time relation as a function of stellar mass for X gas galaxies. You can see that's much higher than the relation uh, at uh, redshifts of one. And the important thing about all of this is that these massive galaxies with stellar masses larger than 10 to the 10 solar masses, they contribute about 65% of the star formation rate density at redshifts larger than one. It's these galaxies that dominate star formation activity and they have an extremely short H1 depletion time. And so what this is telling you is that the very short depletion time in these massive galaxies and in addition, the rapid decrease in, in the gas mass, in the gas fraction at redshifts less than one is telling you loud and clear that probably it, it is insufficient accretion from the CGM that uh, prevents galaxies from sustaining this high star formation rate. And so that's kind of the smoking gun signature that we were looking for. But of course, it begs the question, what slows the accretion down? It, and there are two possibilities now, and we think we have a way of distinguishing between them, but you know, I'm not gonna go into that uh, in this talk. One possibility is that there's a shift to hot mode accretion. And that actually makes a lot of sense because once galaxies cross a certain mass threshold, which is about uh, 10 to the 11 solar masses in terms of dynamical mass, or 10 to the 10 solar masses in terms of stellar mass, there is a shift from cold mode to hot mode. You see that from simulations. And so that is exactly what we're seeing over here. These massive galaxies may be uh, are eating up their stars, their, their H1. And then now, because they are so massive, they've now moved from cold mode accretion into hot mode accretion. And then they cannot actually accrete gas fast enough. Because remember, hot mode accretion happens in much slower time scales. The other possibility is feedback that these massive galaxies are driving powerful winds out of them. And that causes them to actually reduce their star formation activity. And if that is the case, then you should see a correlation between uh, the decline in gas fraction and, and the feedback activity. We don't have those data as yet, but that's something that we will be looking at uh, over the next couple of years. But right now, it seems as though the decline, uh, the short depletion times in massive galaxies and the decline in, uh, in gas fraction in these galaxies indicates that there's less accretion from the certain galactic medium to sustain the, the high star formation rate. And that causes the decline of the star formation rate density in galaxies below redshift so far. That's the picture that we have. Where are we going from here? Of course, we want to complete the analysis of the 520R data set. And there are two things that we're doing. One is to look at the MH1 MB relation redshift of one. We've actually done that already. We're finding evidence for evolution. Again, with brighter galaxies uh, showing the strongest evidence for evolution compared to the local universe. And the second thing, which I think is really interesting, is look at the dependence on environment. And again, there we have tentative results, which I won't talk about now, but watch this space, where we can actually divide the samples based on whether or not they have a companion, and you find differences in their properties based on clustering. So the more clustered galaxies behave differently from the less clustered galaxies at high redshifts. And very interestingly, the behavior is the opposite of what you see in the local universe. And we're finding tentative evidence for this, uh, and that's gonna be super exciting, I would say, over the next six months or so. We're also going to be doing searches for individual 21 centimeter detections at redshifts of 0.4 in the EGS spectral cube. That's the band five data. We started this project off through this huge UGMRT band three survey of Cosmos, where we will stack about, you know, more than about a thousand galaxies at high redshift, redshifts, average redshift of 2.5. And we hope that the prime focus spectrograph on Subaru will, will dramatically increase the number of redshifts in Cosmos, which would really make this project uh, which will allow a very high sensitivity detection of 21 centimeter emission. 
And that let us push to this blue band in redshift space. And finally, we've just got, uh, we've just started observations of a new 580 hour run on the deep two fields at the same redshift range. And the idea is that we're going to do a really detailed study of the evolution over this extremely interesting 2.6 giga year period where things are changing very rapidly uh, in terms of star formation activity in galaxies. The observations of this project have begun now. We got about half the time approved and we, we expect that the observations will get done over the next year or so. And then we'll have results on this in the next couple of years. So watch this space. So to summarize then, I hope I've convinced you that if you want to understand galaxy evolution, you must understand both the stars and the gas. And uh, the big problem for the last you know, few decades has been that we have not been able to understand the atomic gas because the 21 centimeter line is so weak. We now have a way of uh, addressing this problem via 21 centimeter emission stacking. And that lets us measure the average H1 mass of the galaxies of a population. And that needs accurate redshifts for many galaxies. The UGMRT has really made an impact in this field because of its wide frequency coverage and wide, correlate, wide band correlator. And I presented results now where you know, we've stacked emission from about five, 500 galaxies at redshift of 0.35. And we've got an average H1 mass of about five times 10 to the nine in these galaxies. And we've shown that the H1 properties are similar, at least in terms of average properties to, the, to those of galaxies in the local universe. But at redshifts of one, things are dramatically different. We have the first detection of 21 centimeter emission in galaxies at these redshifts. It's about eight sigma right now. And that lets us uh, divide the, the sample into subsamples. And we're finding this extremely short gas depletion time in massive galaxies, about 0.7 giga years, and a rapid decrease in the gas fraction of these galaxies. And this indicates that insufficient gas secretion in CGM leads to the observed decline in star formation or rate density below redshifts of one. So we think we've kind of answered this big picture question in galaxy evolution with these current data. And there's still exciting times because we can now do very detailed studies of the gas properties of star forming galaxies at these redshifts. And of course, as I said, we hope to push to even higher redshifts, redshifts of two and a half or so very soon. So I'll leave you with this. Thank you very much. Great, fantastic talk. Okay, so we already have some questions here. So the first question is from Wenping. He said, oh, it's a remarkable work. So the star formation rate versus the rate shift uh, is interesting. And so the detector sensitivity and spectral resolution matter. So how about the giant single dish versus the interferometers like uh, next generation very large arrays or SKA? Yeah, so th th that's a very good question. So giant single dishes are, are very good, but they have problems. I mean, the problem is that a, a, a giant single dish has a small field of view because your field of view goes like one upon diameter. So the number of galaxies within your field of view is now small. So that's the problem. You can overcome this by building what are called focal plane arrays to try to get a wider field of view, but it's not easy. So for example, FAST, which has effectively a 300 uh, meter diameter, has super high sensitivity. So you can actually do individual detections really well, but your field of view is small. The second problem with single dishes is that single dishes have systematic effects. Uh, they often have, uh, they're more affected by radio frequency interference, and they're also affected by standing waves. Uh, for example, Arecibo was, which used to be used a lot, of, a lot earlier, used a lot, uh, has the issue that if you integrate deeper and deeper and deeper, you wind up with standing waves affecting your, your spectrum. So it's very hard to go very deep with a single dish. With, with interferometers, things are much better. The standing waves basically cancel out in an interferometer. I'm sorry, so I, don't under, hmm? I don't understand this standing wave. What yeah, so that? standing waves are basically when you have a dish and you have a feed over here, the radiation is reflected from the dish surface and is picked up by the receiver. The problem is that, that, it's, that picking up by the receiver is not 100% is not efficient. So some fraction of the radiation gets reflected back from the receiver to the dish and bounces back again. And so now you can produce interference between the original wave pattern and this reflected wave pattern, and that produces a standing wave. I see. And so that's like a ripple in your spectrum. And this happens with all telescopes. It happens with single, for example, Westerbock had a very famous standing wave with a three megahertz ripple. But of course it, it affects single dishes more because with an interferometer, you cancel out these standing waves because you have 
different dishes with slightly different standing wave properties. And, but single dishes have this, this complication and you do bandpass calibration, but it's hard to actually perfectly subtract out the standing waves for a single dish. It, 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 it's a challenge and it's one of the, of the difficult things in single dish spectroscopy. RFI is a huge issue for single dishes. So single dishes are difficult. And the third issue is that the field of view is just small. So it's something that one would like to try. It's not been done as yet. I should mention that, for example, the GBT, the Green Bank Telescope, has tried similar things at redshifts of 0.7. And in fact, uh, Weili Pen and Su Ching Chang, uh, who had, had done a wonderful uh, detection of uh, H1 emission at a redshift of 0.7 uh, using this, using a slightly different, a similar technique, but a slightly different technique using what is called intensity mapping. And that does not allow you to get the average H1 mass of the galaxy, but it lets you get the, the power spectrum, if you like, the total H1 within the field of view, because the field of view is so big. So you wind up, you know, uh, for a single dish, the field of view is, is much bigger than a single galaxy. So therefore you get the H1 of all the galaxies within that region. So that's a catch. The square kilometer array will do wonderfully. In fact, the square kilometer array is being built primarily to, to detect H1 emission. One of the big science goals is to detect H1 emission at redshifts larger than one. So that will be fantastic when it comes. The NGVLA will not go to these frequencies. The NGVLA uh, currently is supposed to go from 10 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. And even if it comes down to one gigahertz, which is unlikely, it, 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 it will only cover redshifts of 0.4 in, uh, in 21 centimeter. It'll do CO really well, but not 21 centimeter. Okay, great. So I think uh, there's another question for, again from Wenping. So why did you combine different kinds of galaxies together? Don't they have different you know, star formation rates? Yeah, so we have a distribution of star formation rates. Sure. We have to combine different kinds of galaxies because, uh, I mean, ideally, we would like to only have galaxies of one kind. What we've done over here is that we've combined main sequence galaxies. So they're galaxies with the same property that they're on the main sequence of galaxy evolution. The star formation rate is roughly proportional to their stellar mass. Basically, we need lots of galaxies to average their signals and to describe the population. Okay. So I have one related question. So what about, is there a possibility that, you know, when you combine all the galaxies, there could be very, you know, close companions, you know, you cannot resolve you know, just basically the number of total galaxies might not be the, you know, Sure, the that, that, that's, actually, yeah. uh, that's a really good question. And that points to why you need an interferometer. So if you looked at the okay. images, uh, uh, let me just go back because that, that's why that's the beauty of the, of the images. So this, the resolution over here, the, the, the GMRT beam is 60 kiloparsecs. Okay. So we are only picking up emission from one galaxy. Okay, you think there, uh, the, it's unlikely. You'll, Extremely yeah, unlikely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you like, you know, you think like. about how close our, compan our companions of galaxies, yeah. uh, 60 kiloparsecs is about the size of a galaxy. It's extremely okay. unlikely that you have a second big galaxy within 60 kiloparsecs of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason that interferometers are so special, that you can actually just get the emission from each galaxy and stack it. If you did this with FAST, for example, or with Arecibo or GBT, your beam is huge. So now you're seeing the emission from all the galaxies within your beam, which, which, which would be a few arc minutes in size. And that would be you know, megaparsecs in size. Here we are actually at 60 kiloparsec resolution. So we're actually seeing each galaxy and only its emission. Okay, good. So uh, I think I can see other questions here. Okay, does the accretion and outflows balance somewhere in the galaxies? I mean, does outflows demand for more and more accretion to balance the overall mass of the galactic system? I, I think that's a, good, that's a good question to which I would say the answer is unclear. So you can see that if you have a disk galaxy, the outflows are usually perpendicular to the disk and the accretion is usually in the plane of the disk. So you might balance the accretion, which is vertical accretion onto the disk, but you might not balance the, accre the accretion from the sides. On the other hand, if you have like a starburst, you know, where, where, the, where, the, where the galaxy really forms stars in every direction and blows out winds in all directions, then you probably would balance the, the infall with the outflow. But I think that's, a, that's the kind of question we would like to address uh, in the future with such studies. We would like to actually look at uh, 
um, the at the at the mass fractions, for example, H one fractions of galaxies which have large amounts of outflows versus small amount of outflows, and we can measure the outflows by the width of the oxygen lines. Okay, so that, that, that's a good question, but it's something that that we need more signal to noise ratio. Yeah, we will get that in a couple of years. Okay, here's a technical question. So, what is a stacking procedure at a you know as particular redshift? There will be foreground as well as background galaxies with respect to the particular redshift. Do you shift them to that specific redshift? Exactly. Yeah. So what we do is that we, we basically we make this the full spectral cube, and at each galaxy location, so the spectral cube is basically frequency in in one direction, and you take out a spectrum of each galaxy. Technically, you take out a spectral cube around each galaxy, which which covers its uh, the, the, a small region around it, and includes its uh, redshifted twenty one centimeter line. Now you shift that redshifted twenty one centimeter line to zero velocity. So to, to, to the rest frame of the galaxy, and so for each galaxy now you have a small cube in which the one axis is velocity in the rest frame of the galaxy, and the other axes are RA and DEC. And if you like, the RA and DEC are relative to the galaxy, so the galaxy is in the center of the sub cube, and the third axis is velocity, which goes from say minus fifteen hundred to plus fifteen hundred kilometers per second. And now you simply stack each plane of the of the of these sub cubes. So then you wind up with a cube now where uh, the emission basically adds up in phase, in velocity and position, okay. and so you get three D information, which is actually wonderful. So, so you you can actually see you can actually measure the size of galaxies if you had enough resolution. So for example, if the galaxy is a hundred kiloparsecs in size, we would be able to see it. We would see them as spatially extended. That's great. Okay. Another question. So, um, okay, this atomic gas density monoton uh, monoton monotonically trace the star formation rate density across all epochs. Uh, that's a very good question, and the answer is no, it does not. Uh, and probably, probably it does not because of the fact that uh, that that you have this mix of feedback outflows and so on going on. So, what so what we know for the atomic gas density. Is that the atomic gas density is quite high in galaxies with redshifts of five, and it slowly declines from redshifts of five. Very slowly, it's kind of flat out to redshifts of about. It's, it declines slowly out to redshifts of about two. And these are from studies of damped Lyman alpha absorbers at high redshifts via absorption, and then from redshifts of two to redshifts of zero, it declines by only a factor of two. And in fact, with our measurements, we actually measured the atomic gas mass density at redshift of one. Of one and we find that it's exactly consistent within the errors with the value at zero. So it looks as though the gas mass density declines by a factor of two from redshifts of two to one, and then stays constant after that. But remember, the star formation rate density is dropping by a factor of ten from redshifts of uh, one to zero. So the the H one is not perfectly tracing the the star formation rate. Uh, it looks as though there's lots of H one. In small galaxies, which don't contribute very much to to the star formation rate, that's the picture, at least that I have in mind, which which should probably explain this. Okay. So, any more questions? Oh, okay, here. So, would the result change if the star formation rate is taken from the redshift surveys, the optical? <laughs> that's a very good question. So the answer is no; it does not change substantially. So we have we have the star formation rates. Uh, it, it depends on what on exactly what you do. So the problem with the star formation rate from the optical is that that star formation rate is affected by dust, by dust obscuration, right? So that's an issue. So uh, if you if you you have to somehow correct for dust obscuration, and that is done by people when they when they make those star formation rate density plots, you always correct for dust obscuration. So we need to correct for dust obscuration somehow. So if you take the star formation, so we can get the star formation rate with uh, via two two methods. One method is via the optical data themselves, which are rest frame uh, near ultraviolet data. The second is via the O2 emission line at three seven two seven angstroms. 
Both of these have corrections of about a factor of two and a half or so to get to uh, the, uh, the total star formation rate. If you make those corrections, then you get exactly the same result. If you don't make those corrections, then you are underestimating the star formation rate because you are ignoring dust. And then of course you get a factor of two higher uh, gas depletion time. It's still large, it's still much shorter than in the, in the local universe, but it'll, it, it will basically be slightly higher, a factor of two higher than what we have uh, with the radio star formation rates. But basically you have to correct the optical star formation rates for dust obscuration. Okay, thank you. So uh, one question from Wei Hao. So uh, you excluded AGNs, right? And rate yes. taxes in your stacking. Yes. So what will happen if you try to stack them? You know, yeah, that, that's, not, that, that's so, a superb because, question. Because yeah, some of them should have still carry H1 gas. Yes. So uh, absolutely. The, uh, in fact, that, that's something we would love to do. So right now we've excluded about a thousand AGNs. So th th there are two problems in this. The, the first one is that it turns out that the Deep 2 Galaxy survey is biased against red galaxies. And that's because of the R band uh, selection at redshifts of one, uh, R band corresponds to the uh, corresponds to about 3000 angstroms, which means you're picking out blue star forming galaxies by using that selection of R of less than 24.1, you're picking out blue star forming galaxies. So there are actually not that many red galaxies at redshifts above one, the, almost none, like 5% or so of the population. So, th so th that doesn't make much of a difference. We, tr we have tried stacking the red galaxies, but there's not too many of them. And so we don't get a very good limit. So we, we don't have a detection. We have also tried stacking the AGNs. And again, we don't see anything in, e in either of them. And the reason again is the same, that the number is still small. But we think that with this new 580R integration, we have a chance of detecting at least the AGNs. So, so we would love to do this. That's, I think that's a really good question because you, you know the, the red galaxies of today are galaxies where the star formation has stopped a long time ago. But 8 billion years ago, those red galaxies had just probably become quiescent. And so you really would like to find out what, what's happening to them. So that's something we, that we would really like to do uh, you know, over the next couple of years. Okay. So I'm curious, the AGN you said here, it's based on radio. It's like a radio now. So it, yeah, so it's then not it's in common, optical, right? It, well, it's a combination of multiple things. So, so we, uh, uh, we are using AGNs, we are excluding AGNs based on, for example, suppose they have, uh, suppose they're classified as AGNs from the optical imaging and spectra. Then we exclude them. But we also exclude okay. AGNs if we detect them in the radio continuum individually. Because it turns out that we are sensitive to about uh, a 1.4 gigahertz luminosity of about two times 10 to the 23 watts per hertz. And that's been shown to basically pick out AGNs. So if you have a four sigma detection, any, any object which is, which is detected individually at above four sigma significance, we basically throw it out uh, as a likely AGN. Okay. And, okay. and there are a few that we pick out from the optical as well. I think there's one comment from Wei Hao based on you know, your answer. You said, I see, then we will really need Cosmos plus PFS. Sure. I, I mean, we are waiting for PFS yeah. and Cosmos. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if PFS, P I mean, PFS is especially important because of its redshift coverage, because, uh, you know, getting a lot of galaxies at a redshift range of 1.8 to 2.8 is really hard, you know, with high redshift accuracy. And PFS will do that. So I'm, I'm really waiting for PFS. I mean, that, that's a spectacular instrument. I don't know, it's probably you know, delayed or... Yeah, but that, yeah. But so so, so we, we, we'll take the data and once PFS comes along, we'll stack happily, you know, once the redshifts are available. Right. Okay, great. So one more question here. Um, does the mass of the galaxies that dominate the star formation rate density at a particular redshift change with the redshift? That's a very good question. And the answer is yes, it does. It turns out that, the, that you can actually, so if you look at the star formation rate density plot, you can make the same plot, but now binned by the stellar mass of the galaxies. So you can actually measure the contribution to the star formation rate density from different populations of galaxies. And you see exactly what the question is asking, that at higher redshifts, I mean, this is like, this is basically cost me downsizing. At higher redshifts, it's the higher mass, stellar mass galaxies that dominate. So for example, when redshifts are one and two, 
the galaxy is between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 solar masses in stars dominate the star formation rate. At, at redshift less than one, the, that, that thing shifts to the lower mass galaxies. Right. Okay. Any more questions for anything? We have a lot of good questions here. You know, yeah, so far. really impressed. Great. Any more? Okay. That's pretty late here, I think. Yeah. For <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm impressed that all of you are awake over there. For... There's still about you know, 9.30. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. Good. So, I mean, it's a fantastic talk. And you know, thanks again for you know, staying with us. And, and thank you everyone for joining today's talk. Yeah, I think that's the end of today's talk. If there are no more questions, yeah, we already have a lot actually. And hopefully, yeah, I think we'll see you again maybe in the future. I hope to come visit, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully, you know, you never know. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'll see you next time, okay? Bye everybody. Yeah, all bye, right, everyone.